You're listening to That Gets My Goat. You should know better. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gets My Goat for another week here at uh, the That Gets My Goat feed. I'm Big Anklevich. Who? <laughs> uh, Big Anklevich. Come on, you know, a world famous podcaster. Boy, and I, I guess that would make me Rich Outfield. Who? <laughs> Not at all famous. Co podcaster <laughs> with, with Big Anklevich. <laughs> Guys? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we're here, and uh, what are we going to be talking about today, Rich? Well, you know, we were going to do movies, but uh, I've been told by corporate that it would be much more profitable if we would change formats, and so from this point on, we are going to be a sports talk podcast. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, they um, asked me what my opinion was, and I thought that sports talk, we could we could actually make a go of it. Okay. You and I are passionate enough, we have enough of a knowledge base that we we could go far, I think, with this. All right. That may not have been my first suggestion for us, but I guess we can give it a shot. It would have been nice to have had some warning ahead of time to prepare, but that's okay. I, I could probably uh, wing it. So, cool. Well, what are we going to talk about then? Let me see. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll provide a topic and we'll see how it goes. Okay. So the All-Star Game, the baseball All-Star Game just happened. Uh -huh. I'm sure you caught that. Yeah. In, in your opinion... Who who is the better catcher? Would it be the American League starting catcher Salvador Perez, or the National League starter uh, Jonathan Lacroix? What do, what do you think? Well, you know that's an interesting question. Uh, Jonathan Lacroix, I think, probably has a stronger arm and can pick off runners. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to steal second base a lot easier. But uh, at the plate, I'm not really. Uh, what, what do you know? What the batting average is for uh, both of those catchers? Could you? Uh, the well, I mean, it's it's. That's a matter of opinion, right? The 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 the, the batting batting average, <laughs> right? I mean, a matter, I don't. I mean, one guy can say that it's a, a a four, and another guy can say no, it's in the low twos. Yeah. Or or not? Or uh, somebody else could say that it's in the the sixty percentile, or 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 a C. Okay. Some might say he's batting a thousand. Well, you're right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thou yeah. That's that would be the first one. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure that it actually works that way, Rish. I think a batting average is kind of a hard and fast stat. Kind of like, you know, three times six is eighteen. It's always eighteen. Okay, so so yes, I believe Salvador Perez's uh is an eighteen. Um I'm not so sure that this is gonna work out here rich uh but, but i uh the other guy uh, Lacroix, got a first down i've been told uh just right in the uh the first the, the first half yeah on the ice and uh <laughs> and because of that uh free throw that he 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 botched so badly they gave him a yellow card and then uh they they sent him to the showers which is is, is just terrible for a young player like that or old player i'm not quite sure i mean it depends on how you look at him whether he is old or yeah or young. it is a matter of opinion yes it is yeah 60 is the new 40 oh boy so any other topics you want to discuss about the all-star game yeah the, the the tkos were really high and the, there was a lot of cuffing cuffing you know uh something i thought would probably be a cool thing to talk about today Lacrosse. Guardians of the Galaxy came out this week. It did? Yeah, although when people actually hear this, it was probably a month ago. But you and I actually both saw that and understood that. So maybe we should talk about that. Okay, let's give that a try as part of our new format. Okay. Actually, I think you could probably even hold forth as an expert with the amount of uh, research you put into movies. So... Uh, yeah, I think we'll go with that. Okay, so Guardians of the Galaxy, the tenth Marvel Cinematic Universe film. Oh, this is number ten. Can you name uh, all all ten? Uh, the first one was Iron Man one, right? That's right. So let's see: Iron Man one, Thor one, The Incredible Hulk. There was Iron Man two and three, so that gets me to five. Yep. There was Captain America one and two, gets me to seven. There was a second. 
Thor movie gets me to eight. And the Avengers gets me to nine. Dang it, that's not... Wait, this is the tenth? Yes. So that gets me all of them then, right? It did. I did it. Yes. Yes, uh, the only one you'd forgotten was uh, Made in Manhattan, which was the Jennifer Lopez, <laughs> Ray Fiennes movie. Well, that's right. And Howard the Duck. Oh, wait, that comes later. Sorry. Much later, let's hope. <laughs> but yeah, that is, uh, that's interesting that they've already made 10. That's kind of surprising. I guess that just shows how fast time seems to fly the older that you get. Because it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that Marvel Studios came into being, at least to me. I guess my kids, for them, it's been like half of their lifetime, so it seems like a big deal. But that, that is interesting that there's already ten films. Are, are they settling down to just two a year? Is that what I've uh, been led to understand, or is that not the case? Next year we have another Avengers movie, right? Right. What else is there next year? Ant-Man? Next year's Ant-Man, yeah. Hmm. Do you think they'll ever expand their uh, schedule and include, like, a third film, or are we... Yeah, I think so. I mean, are you going to count Big Big Hero 6 as a Marvel film? I don't know. Does, does it count? I, I don't Disney think so. Film, it right? is Disney, but I don't imagine it's Marvel Cinematic Universe, especially, I think, it t since it c takes place in the future. Okay, so that one just fits into the Disney, under the Disney umbrella, because Disney animated features has their own little thing going on and interestingly enough some people uh found it worth their while to point out that the character from of rapunzel appeared for all of about 10 frames in uh in frozen so apparently they have their disney cinematic universe that they're <laughs> i thought that was cool they must be building up to a, a princess avengers movie coming up in a few years They'll have Rapunzel, who will be like Hawkeye, because she can use her hair like a whip or something to hit things from far away. Is there a, a superhero that has like a whip? Doesn't Catwoman use a whip? Okay, yeah. So there you go. She could be the Catwoman character. And then Elsa could be, you know, like uh, Iceman. And Spider-Man and his amazing friends or something could come together here. Right, and, and Merida could be Firestar. There you go. Except for Merida, I guess, is really more like Hawkeye than anything else. Yeah, I, I can see this happening. This is going to be good. Princess Avengers. I like it. I'm all for it. Although Merida didn't really make an appearance in any of those because she's Pixar, which is sort of separate, right? Yeah, I still see some people lump her in with the Disney princesses. and Well, yeah, I mean... But, I mean, that's another subject. We could talk, We could do it. That gets my goat about Disney princesses. Did we ever do something about that? We might have. I know... I guess we complained about it on our drive up to Vegas. That's true. About the... Uh, the marketing of certain movies. Yeah, as far as the marketing stuff goes and, and merchandising, I think Merida counts as part of the... Anybody that's princess-esque, they'll just throw her in there. I'm sure they were stoked to have two new ones from the last movie. They're probably going to start doing like they did with Batman, where they start giving them like extra villains just so they have more toys to sell. They'll probably just like have three or four. They'll they'll do that. Twelve dancing princesses next, maybe, so they can have all twelve princesses to sell. Anyway, sorry, we've kind of strayed off topic. Um, we were going to talk about yes. Oh shoot, what was it? Transformers Four. I think it was uh, Yasiel Puig and just, uh, you know, the the great turnaround the Dodgers have had since they, they got him on board. See, I don't see how you can talk about that stuff when you don't even like baseball. <laughs> and I do like baseball, but I can't say nothing. Uh, the, before we move back to Guardians of the Galaxy, I did want to say one thing. My kids were watching those How It Should Have Ended movies that they have on YouTube. Okay. And they did one for Frozen, which I thought was pretty funny. It was just a quickie, I think. They just, you know, showed her. They, like, took her to the, the trolls or whatever. And the trolls are like, okay, so here's what you got to do. And the parents keep going, so what you're saying is we need to hide her away. And they're like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, so what you're saying is conceal, don't feel. No, no, you guys are the worst parents ever. And he's like, it's love, love, okay? <laughs> But then it went to the, you know, how it should have ended. And it, finally he's like, okay, I know somebody you just need to go and see. 
and then all of a sudden they open the door and they come in with Elsa and then Charles Xavier turns around and he's like, welcome Elsa to my school for <laughs> exceptional children. I thought that was pretty funny. That is good. And then Iceman, at the end, they had one of those little kind of post-credit things where Elsa was like singing with all the X-Men and then Iceman was just like, ah, the cold doesn't bother me anyway. I think Iceman felt like his territory had been encroached upon. All right, so Guardians of the Galaxy, the 10th Marvel feature film universe extravaganza. This one was unusual, uh, very suspect. People didn't know what was going to happen with this because the Guardians of the Galaxy are not a property. They're just a, oh, wait, what is that? People don't know about the Guardians of the Galaxy. You don't go to it with any set expectations or, uh, you know, biases or anything like that because they're, do they, do they have their own book? Yeah, the, there have been several Guardians of the Galaxy books and teams and this was sort of a greatest hits kind of thing, uh -huh. just taking characters that uh, have been popular and, and putting them all together. And, uh, you know, it, it was so long in coming that they are like that this team actually exists in the comics now, exactly as it is in the movie. Well, it seems like they do that. Um, and of course, they're much more popular now than they've ever been <laughs> in the comics. <laughs> Obviously. And you and I both saw him on the cartoons. They showed up on the Spider-Man cartoon. I saw them on the Avengers cartoon. Yeah, that's where I first saw them was on the Avengers cartoon where they just showed up and they had a little bit uh, with the Avengers there. It does seem like they do that, you know, to prepare you for the com for the movies or whatever. They start making a, a comic book that goes with it so that those people that are suddenly interested in Guardians of the Galaxy when they see the movie can go to the store and buy comic books about them because there's been some to buy. You know, whereas I would guess the Guardians of the Galaxy haven't, they're probably one of those teams that hasn't had like a continuous book, you know, for 35 no, years. No, no, they're always, they start and then they stop. Yeah, that's what I... These are, they're minor enough characters. I think we've had this conversation that I had no idea who they were. I vaguely remember Rocket Raccoon having his own title when I was a kid, but... Oh, really? You know, none of the other guys meant anything to me until they were making this movie and i did a little research on that but there's a great advantage to that there's no preconceived notions of of what the character is like or who who would be perfect for the part or oh geez they got his face wrong or his costume wrong or what about this power they didn't even yeah, mention that's what that. i was gonna say you definitely didn't hear people moaning about, oh, no, Star-Lord's costume is totally not right or whatever, like you do with every other superhero movie. When Wonder Woman's costume picture came out, I rolled my eyes and said, come on. And when Batman's comes out, you're, you know, you see Superman with no underwear on and no cape, and you're just like, oh, these people, they don't know anything. But you don't have to deal with that with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Who? Now, I heard a lot of people say before this movie came out that it was going to be more like space opera than a superhero film. Did you get that feeling from it when you watched it? Oh, absolutely, man. The movies this most reminded me of were Star Wars and The Last Starfighter. <laughs> and then, you know, Firefly, it also really, really felt like. But Firefly was also... Well, it was a space western, but it was, you know, it was very much in the vein of the adventures of Han Solo kind of thing. And this felt like you had a, a Chewie type character and a Han type character. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was fun in the way that the Star Wars movies should be fun. Uh huh. And yeah, it wasn't science fiction, it was fantasy, you know? Right. In the same way that Star Wars is not science fiction, but it's, it's, space fantasy uh -huh. you don't didn't feel that way did i it didn't feel like a superhero movie to me at all yeah it didn't i, I was gonna say that i mean they included stuff that you know from the marvel universe the bad guys were kree bad guys who are a race of aliens that we know from the marvel universe uh i found it interesting you never heard about the uh uh the damned scrolls thank you i was thinking chitari and i'm like crap what is their real name 
You never heard about the uh, Skrulls in this film because they're tied up in the contract with the Fantastic Four, right? Isn't that what the deal is? I believe so, yeah. Okay. I think that's why uh, there were no Skrulls there. Yeah, I, if, uh, if I remember right, that the Skrulls are basically the Chitari, and the Chitari are supposed to be, the, you know, they were the bad guys for the uh, Avengers movie, but they just kind of came up with a new name and went with something else. But anyways, yeah, the Skrulls, aren't the Krees and the Skrulls basically like the two races that are always warring up in, in space in the Marvel Universe? Well, there's a million different aliens, but yeah, I, I think th there was a big deal about, you know, the Skrulls having this huge armada and the Kree having this giant army or whatever you want to call it. And uh, but, but they were enemies and we get caught in the middle of it. Yeah. But uh, they're both bad. Right. And I think that that's cool. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, it's not like we want to side with either. Uh -huh. And yeah, the face of the Kree was friggin' Ronan the Accuser. Right. And wow, what a face. I think I expressed to you how much I hated that guy <laughs> in this movie. I, I just like, wow. It, he was he was just like so irredeemably evil, and he had no charm or sense of humor, or he had nothing redeeming about him at all. Yeah, he was just a bad guy. Even when... Weird stuff happened, like the uh, little dance-off bit. He's <laughs> just like, what What are you doing? <laughs> I thought it was good, his reaction. Now, did you hate him because of what he was on this film? Or you led me to believe that you basically already hate Lee Pace because he plays a douchebag bad guy in every film that he's in. He's a, the douchebag in... The Hobbit trilogy, right? Yeah, he's Legolas's father, and, and, you know, I guess the elves aren't evil. But he's certainly a douche. Okay. And uh, What else has he been it in? It seems like there was one other movie where it's like, gosh, I wonder who that guy is. And it's like, oh, that's big Pushing Daisies dude. Yeah, see, he wasn't, he was the most charming, oh, shucks, uh, wonderful kind of little guy in Pushing Daisies, so it surprises me that that's what he plays in other areas but it kind of makes me think I, I i think when you were saying that i leaned over and said to you maybe it's like carrie elwes who you know he had his one basically his one chance to be a good guy in princess bride and then from then on out he was always a, a douchebag he was always the the other man or the bad guy or whatever it was he was never somebody you know redeemable after that luckily he's of course known most for the princess bride so uh he doesn't i guess have to deal i'm sure lee pace is not going to be known most for pushing daisies because people probably don't even remember that show anymore i would guess you you know what else the the film was that uh, he was in that where he was a jerk uh. was that lincoln that lincoln movie like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's yeah. like, who are you just to make equal who God has made unequal? Yeah, he was the opposing senator or whatever in that whole uh, thing. That's what I, we, else we knew him from. So he was a good bad guy is what you're trying to say. Well, he was unique. I mean, like a lot of these characters. And you know what? They gave him a bit of a backstory where he had been wronged and all that. But they did the clever trick of having him be a religious zealot as well. And that just sucks any sympathy from the character in my in my mind. You know, he was just he was he was a monster, and uh, you wanted it, him to get his comeuppance. Whereas there have been other characters, you know, namely Loki, that kind of guy, where you're just like, gosh, I kind of want him to get away. I want to see him come back. Uh huh. He was a different kind. It's cool. I mean, there were so many characters, so many different kinds of characters. The the character of Star Lord is you know the main guy on this and that yeah they did kind of take steps to make him you know a rogue and untrustworthy and, you know he's a thief and all that stuff and he's he's a scoundrel uh -huh. uh, and then he teams up with all these other guys that are, are all out for themselves and none of them have any friends or any loyalties and and somehow that we get a team out of it and i mean that was just i i it was magical man to see all of these guys 
See, because I, I didn't know how they were going to get together or what the deal was and how they all wanted the money or they wanted him. And then they all end up together and they're forced to team up to survive. I was just like, that is really, really cool. It reminded me a lot of the kind of the format that they did with uh, the Avengers movie where they first made them all fight with each other as if to pay off all those comic book dorks who really want to know who would win in a fight, Thor or Iron Man or Captain America or whatever. And then they made them come together and uh, make a team out of them. Of course, nobody is sitting around arguing who would win in a fight, Groot or Rocket Raccoon or Drax. But they managed to, to give us the chance to see all that stuff anyways. Which is cool. I, I like when that happens. I liked to to see people. It, it's almost like a romantic comedy, you know, where the the romantic comedy always starts out, and the two lovers hate each other always from the beginning, and then they somehow learn to see beyond that. And that seemed like what the Guardians of the Galaxy were, and all the way up until the very end, you know, when they f go to for the final battle or whatever they still seem like, you know, they're only sort of a team. And then they kind of finally come together, which, yeah, that was a really cool element. Were there any of the characters that you didn't didn't like? I don't think so. I think I enjoyed them all. Um, the one that was the probably the least likable was Gamora, just because she was always... Zoe Saldana. Serious, you know what I mean? really they never softened her very much she was always always tough and she never said you know you had drax the destroyer who was really really tough all the time but he was also really dumb and said a lot of really dumb things and you know his whole thing with with his family dying seemed to be like a much bigger deal than you know, they had Zoe Saldana saying, oh, you know, they killed my family and I just want to get back at them. But, yeah, her story seemed less of a big deal. Well, why does Zoe Saldana always play that character? Is that just who she is? Or is it kind of like Carrie Elwes? They saw her play this character once and they're like, oh, you know who would be great for this? Zoe Saldana. And we'll have her be exactly like she was in Avatar or in... Star Trek or in Colombiana or, you know what I mean? Maybe uh, they see that she uh, works that way. And so, they go, you know, maybe it's a typecasting. I don't know. But yeah. What you said about Drax, it, it, whoever came up with the idea of Drax's species being literal and having him constantly take things literally is a genius, man. <laughs> I could watch seven movies of Drax doing that. Uh huh. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too strong. <laughs> I would catch it. Yes. Yeah, that was that was pretty funny. It seemed like they let off a little on that as uh, time went by, and he started to, I guess, figure things out. Even I think there was one point where he said something sarcastic, and uh, somebody pointed that out, and I was just like, "Dang it! I think I missed the line. I didn't hear it well." Uh, well, when he kills Korath, he says, my finger is at your throat. It's a metaphor. <laughs> oh, is that what he said? And I just loved that. It was just, it was so cool. Oh, that man. personality trait was really unique to me. I mean, like Data did it on Star Trek The Next Generation or whatever, but Data wasn't dumb. He was a child. Right. And, the, oh, it was just really cool. And... uh that guy, you know, um, Dave Bautista is, yeah, I, I don't know why I haven't ever seen him in anything. I mean, granted, he looks like a monster in real life, <laughs> but I mean, how come that guy's not playing Hercules or? Uh, yeah, you know, he's, kinda... well, he's not a star, so I'm sure that's part of it. Maybe he will become one by way of these films, but I was just looking at his IMDb and his entire credits are basically WWE Wrestling. Pro, yeah, productions. So if he keeps it up, he may well wind up being one of those guys. But he definitely played the, the big dumb guy really well. 
I never once rolled my eyes and thought, oh, why did they cast a freaking wrestler? You know. No, I, and I hear you. And that can be a trap where they do that, where they hire a model or they hire a singer or an athlete in a part that should go to an actor. Right. But another thing that was really strange was Chris Pratt as the lead hero. He's always been, you know, the the best friend character, the you know the the drinking buddy or the the brother or you know or the fat guy. Yeah, I I, I mentioned that to you as we were watching the film. There's the part where he takes off his shirt at some point. I think it was when they first put him in prison, and he comes in there, and he's got you know they sprayed him down with disinfectant or whatever and then he comes out and he's got no shirt on and he is freaking ripped the guy is buffed the last time i saw him he was on that delivery man movie with vince vaughn that was recently man yeah it was pretty recently he was the best friend and he was i think he had been left by his wife and he had like several kids and and yeah, he was pudgy and he was goofy. And obviously, in this film, he was still a little goofy, which was cool. He was he his character was really interesting. He was like Han Solo, but more of a bumbling Han Solo. Maybe it's funny. I was in the store one time and I, I was stand. I was looking at the toys, and I saw somebody else that was there, and they were also looking at the toys and. They were talking back and forth to each other, and they found that Star Lord figure. Who? Like on the shelf, and one of them said, to, "He's like, oh, Star Lord, this guy's like the Sean Spencer of the Marvel world." Who? And it took me a second to realize who Sean Spencer was. Do you know who that is? I don't. Have you ever seen that TV show Psych? Yeah. Sean Spencer is the the main character of Psych, so he's really goofy. Yet, also competent, you know what I mean? He solves all these crimes, but he does it in a really goofy, bumbling, uh, annoying way. So I guess I could see that. He's not as goofy. Star-Lord was not as goofy as Sean Spencer is. But, yeah, he's definitely a kooky dude, which you see from the very beginning. I mean, they, they let you realize what his character was like from the very first trailer that came out, you know? It was the same scene that was the opening scene of the movie where he gets the orb and then he's like, they come in and tell him to drop it. And he's like, hey, no problem at all. Yeah, no, no, no big deal. You guys have it. Seriously. But even before that, he puts on the headphones right? and he's listening to the song and the credits roll and he's basically dancing around and remember kicking these creatures and he grabs the one and uses it as a microphone. Right. That... It's so, like, unapologetically, I don't want to say cheesy, but... Silly? It is. It's just, it's like carefree, or it's just like, hey, folks, this is what this movie is going to be like. Deal with it. Yeah, or, it was... or Or leave. Go get your money back right now, because <laughs> this, is, this is setting the tone for the rest of the movie. And I dug that, man. It just, it, it set things up perfect, because, you know, there was danger and you know all these monsters wanted to eat him and yeah there's this big pit filled with like black slugs or something like that and he's still listening to this music on an old walkman just dancing around I, it, it, it just showed you this movie is going to be fun you know what i mean the, the, the this is not this film has not been influenced by the success of the dark knight in <laughs> any way Right, yeah, they definitely let you know. And that's cool that they did that, you know. It's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, there's some movies where they don't, you don't know what's going on with them at first. Like, the classic example, I think, of that is that, that Romeo plus Juliet Shakespeare film Ooh. that they did in the 90s, where it starts out with what would have been the sword fight, the opening sword fight from Romeo and Juliet, although it's a gunfight in this one. And it's crazy they're doing just weird stuff they're ramping up the speed on the on the film here and there and everywhere and and they're just doing really odd things and it's not until a good 20 minutes or so into the film where it finally settles down into a normal movie and then you're like oh okay oh this isn't this is just a it's a reg okay cool so i can handle sitting through the rest of this it's not i don't need to be on something to get it 
<laughs> on something. <laughs> it seemed like you needed to be at the first of that movie, but and yeah, this is you know this was not one of those where they suddenly change the tone on you. What? Well, see, I may have to disagree on that. I don't know if you've seen anything by James Gunn before. Okay. But this guy really was remarkable because as silly as the movie is, it's also like really miserable and morose. And it starts out with, you know, just an, a very unhappy tear jerking scene. Almost every one of these damned characters, except for Groot, had some kind of tragic backstory and death and loneliness and despair going on with them. You know what I mean? True enough. And I, I'm not really arguing. I'm just saying, how do you balance that? You know, like all of these characters had a backstory as bleak as Bruce Wayne's <laughs> right. in the Dark Knight trilogy. And yet it never becomes gritty and gray and morose like the Dark Knight trilogy. True. I'm not sure how you balance that. I, I, I guess I would ask him if I saw him. It's like, how, how low can you go? And I, I, him not taking his mother's hand and then she dies is really low. That's true. And then how high can you go? And immediately after that, it's like, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, what's the matter? You know, you're just like, wow, uh, okay. And, you know, like bright colors and laughter and, and, and shooting people and, and, and a talking raccoon. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen a lot of James Gunn stuff. No one I has. I think I did, I did see the Scooby-Doo movie that he did, but... Uh... I think that's about it. Has he done a lot? I'm looking he, at his stuff here. Did he write the Scooby-Doo movies? Is, I think that's... He, he wrote... Because I think Raja Gosnell directed the Scooby-Doo movie. He did Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, written by... Okay. Is this his first directorial movie? No, he did... Uh, let's see, he did Slither. He did... Shoot, what was the movie that said Shut Up Crime... It was a, a, I think it was called Super. Super? Uh huh. He did I, I, something called Movie 43. Well, that was like an a, anthology a and everybody shot like a little 43. clip. He did Human Z. Oh, that was a TV series he <laughs> directed the pilot of. He did a trauma uh, movie. I think he got his start in trauma films. And yeah. I saw Lloyd Kaufman in the movie for a second. Yeah, that was one of those Easter eggs that was mentioned because. Apparently he got his start with Troma, and so he took the dude that got him his start at Troma and put him in the background. He was in, like, the prison scene when the guys are all yelling. No, 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 I saw him, yeah. And I was just like, wow, that's Lloyd Kaufman. And they didn't do any makeup on him or anything. Why not? Well, they... Why, they just wanted it to be obviously Lloyd Kaufman in the same way they wanted it to be obviously Stan Lee? He probably did not want to have to sit in that chair and get covered in freaking pink or whatever. That seemed to be the majority of the makeup that they would do with people. Is just this guy is blue, this guy is pink, this guy is green, etc. I liked that when that pink chick pops up at the beginning of the movie, and he's like, "Oh, honestly, I I forgot you were here." Right. It, the, the the pink characters and the blue characters were I don't know they were refreshing in a way because they were just so unapologetically like garishly. 70s comic book, you know, kind of thing. It seemed, you know, how we, we, we compared this to Star Wars, the way they had the aliens done up seemed very Star Trek to me. Star Trek has always had this, you know, everybody basically is human. They're all humanoid, but some people have, you know, lumps on their forehead or they have pointy ears or something like that. But in general, they're all very humanoid. Although nobody seemed to be weirded out by Groot, you didn't see a lot of other aliens that were weird, like Groot, which I guess is understandable because that's CG you'd have to pay for, I guess. Well, there was Nathan Fillion. True. Did you know that was Fillion? I didn't. Yeah, that was another. When I when I looked up the Easter eggs, they mentioned oh, see, Nathan I, Fillion. I, I kept watching for him through the whole dang movie. And he didn't show up. And then in the credits, it, it said he was, you know, he was the guy that grew, stuck his fingers in his nose. Right. And I was just like, oh, that, okay. Yeah. They, they were saying, because I guess Fillion was in Slither. Yeah. And oh, and the creatures from Slither were in the movie. The Collector had him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, apparently the Collector had a lot of stuff in the background. 
I couldn't see anything myself, but you'll have to send me the link to that because yeah, there's I'm sure there's stuff I didn't recognize. I mean, there wasn't a bunch of them. There's only about seven or eight. I've almost mentioned them all already. So there you go. I think another one that they mentioned was Stan Lee was in the background. <gasps> Big surprise for everybody watching. But yeah, it was a really fun film. That was one of those things that I loved. It, like you were saying, it never went into that, you know, the morass that you could fall into with so many characters with such tragic backstories, etc. And maybe it was just because all the characters were kind of screw-ups. Yeah, I look around, I see a bunch of losers. Which worked in both ways. You know, they really were losers as well as those who lost something. Um, as he tries to amend it when he says that. They were all kind of screw-up type guys. Peter Quill likes to think of himself as Star-Lord. And, you know, he's trying to Who? nickname himself about as Star-Lord. But nobody calls him that because he has no reputation. He's just a goofball. Um, it's not like he's this well-known, amazing dude. All of them are kind of that way. In one way or another. I mean, Rocket Raccoon is just a raccoon. So I guess just he's born to be a screw-up. And he's more rising above what he could be, I would say. He but was great, by the way. I was. loved Rocket Raccoon, man. Yeah, me too. I, I Afterward, I, I I had a conversation. I was like, well, who did you like better? And it was between Groot and Rocket. And I don't know. There's, there was something about... Because Rocket was really damaged, too. But he had, like, that streetwise and high-pitched voice. You know, he kind of reminded me of when Joe Pesci would be on the Lethal Weapon movies, you know? Uh-huh. But, of, of course, you know, he's a much more effectual Joe Pesci. And I, I remember people complained when Bradley Cooper got cast as the voice. But, yeah, whatever they did to Bradley Cooper, I, I didn't see Bradley Cooper in there at all. It yeah. was just, you know, a totally unique character I'd not seen before. Yeah, I mean, neither. I wouldn't have guessed even that that was Bradley Cooper. I don't know Bradley Cooper that well, I have to admit. But Vin Diesel even did a good job, you know? Vin Diesel, friggin' Vin Diesel, who, if he wasn't just a voice, I would almost, I, I don't know. I mean, he falls, we've talked a lot of times about doing a episode where we just talk about the, uh, what is your word for it? The... Deal breakers. Deal breakers, that's it. Somebody who's a deal breaker where you want to see this movie and then you find out, oh, wait, what? Vin Diesel is the star of it? Oh, I guess I don't need to see it then. It's like, for example, that Hercules movie that just came out. I would probably go and see a Hercules movie, but then I found out that The Rock is Hercules, and I'm just like, oh, it's going to be that kind of a movie. I guess I probably don't need to bother with it. <laughs> Vin Diesel is one of those guys where when I find out Vin Diesel's in a movie, I'm like, oh, jeez. I see what kind of a movie we're dealing with here, and I'm not interested after all. It's weird because Guardians of the Ga a Marvel film and a Vin Diesel film, you know, it's like deal maker, deal breaker come together in one. Luckily, he was just the voice of the guy who only can say, I am Groot. So it's hard for even Vin Diesel to mess that up. Yeah, see, if they had cast Vin Diesel as Star-Lord or something like that, I mean, I don't... I, see, I, I, I despise Vin Diesel. I think that guy is a zero charisma in the words of a Dungeons & Dragons manual. <laughs> and I just can't imagine him bringing anything but tough guy a holitude to a character. And, you know, maybe someday something like that will happen where they'll cast one of those deal breakers in a movie I really have to see, or really want to see, rather, and I'll, you know, I'll have to learn to live with it, but... Yeah, well, with the amount of movies Marvel's making, eventually somebody like that's going to get in there. I don't have a lot of deal breakers, though. Yeah, I don't have that many either, but yeah, Vin Diesel is one of those where I'm just like, come on. But you never know. Like, I went and saw that G.I. Joe movie that was starring The Rock as Roadblock. And I didn't hate it. Oh, the second one. Yeah, the second one. I didn't hate it. See, I don't hate The Rock at all, but he's not an actor, you know? Right. He's The Rock, and that's all he plays. And, you know, every once in a while, there'll be a movie with Justin Timberlake in it, 
And he's not an actor. The guy is a singer. The guy is a dancer. <laughs> he's not an actor. And I don't know why I'm the only person that sees that, but... <laughs> I, I think everybody knows it. It's just some producers are like, hey, Justin Timberlake, that'll get butts in seats. Nothing else is going to get butts in seats for this movie, so let's cast him. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the film. One thing that I did think that may have been somewhat of a fault to it was uh, it seems like ever since movies have gone computer animated over actual sets... They basically overdo it. You know what I mean? There's like so... It's it's like the Transformers thing, you know? Transformers are a relatively clean, easy-to-look-at bunch of robots. You know, you can, you can tell what their arms and legs and everything are when they were the cartoon. But once they made this computer-animated film of them, they so complicated them that they have a bajillion moving parts underneath all those, you know, what should be arms and legs, and it's just too busy to even want to look at. And I did feel that there was a few times in this film where they had just overdone it. I would say in that, what was it called, Nowhere, the planet where they, the, that was the head of the... The head of the celestial. The, yeah, the ancient celestial being or whatever. It was Unicron's head that was out there floating it seemed like that, especially the chase scene in that bit where they're flying those little pods, the mining pods or whatever, and they're going in and out and through all these things that are just everywhere. It, I don't know. It kind of bugs me. It's a little busy. It makes me long for, you know, the trench at the Death Star where they just go in there and fly and, you know, the worst you got is just some model uh, ship pieces glued to the to wall or whatever to make it look fancy. I don't know, did you feel that at all, or did you think it was all awesome? <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't. I didn't feel the busyness. There were a couple of quick cuts and stuff, but except for, like, uh, Ronan's army, whatever you want to call those creatures, there was a name for those necroids or whatever they were. Oh, yeah. Sorry, was that racist? <laughs> I think uh, Star-Lord called him a ninja turtle at the start. <laughs> oh, now that is racist. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there were a couple of times where I was just like, wait, no, wait, who was that? Wait, what? Oh, okay. He died. So obviously he's not one of the good guys. <laughs> I don't know. There, there was a lot of busyness with like the dog fights and all that, especially back at the end in, in Xandar. Is that what it was called? Something like that, yeah. But uh, there was an awful lot. It, it, he joined up with the guys that he used to like fly around with, and they were on like one ship. But then they had like suddenly an, there's a hundred ships. You yeah, know? they had an entire army of like fighter planes that came out of there, which surprised me. I don't know where those all came from, but apparently uh, they were a big group, and we just didn't realize that. I, the only thing that I was disappointed by, except for the coda, was. Thanos. I thought Thanos looked terrible. I thought he looked really goofy. And I thought, uh, what's his name? A uh, Josh Brolin's voice was not appropriate for Thanos. I, you know, he is this great, terrible thing. I, he, and they did him CG. And it just like, wait, why? You didn't do him CG in the last time we saw him. Hmm. I don't know. I, I did, did, what did you think of Thanos? Uh, I have no idea about Thanos at all uh, previous to the, like the first time I'd ever heard that he existed was when he showed up in the Avengers credits um, so I have no pre-existing idea of what he should look like or anything it seemed fine to me but you know I don't know I don't know what he's supposed to, and when we saw him the other time all we saw was like a, a shot of him smiling true so yeah. I don't know I don't know. I For some reason, I just thought he was super cartoony, and he didn't need to be. You know who looked super cartoony to me? <laughs> was Glenn Close as Nova Prime. <laughs> she looked like she was dressed up as her in her Cruella de Vil getup. Like, what was that weird freaking hairdo that they gave her? I don't know. There's something really odd. Every time she showed up, I was just like, what? <laughs> what is this? She reminded me of 
the person that tells you how to put your seatbelt on before you get on Star Tours. <laughs> okay, the last time I got on Star Tours, sadly, was like 1992, maybe earlier than that. So. Right, but it was still like the stuff from 1986 <laughs> that they had recorded then that you're watching. With, and it didn't quite fit with Star Wars. It was just this ridiculous idea of what the future would be like, even though Star Tours is a long time ago. Right, uh, yeah. But, it's just the the goofy hairdo thing. I don't know. But you know whose design I thought was awesome? Who? Uh, Nebula. The other daughter of Thanos. Oh, okay. She, I, th I loved every second she was on the screen. I was like, wow, look at that. Partly because it was makeup instead of CG kind of thing. And it's just, she didn't look like anybody I had seen before. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting when, you know, that had that part just after she got like blasted. I can't remember what it was, she, but she gets totally like blown up. And then you see like her arm and everything like realigning itself back into place. That was very interesting. And she got away. Yeah, that's one of those things, that which is cool. I talked with my kids afterwards and asked them what they thought about it when they saw it. And they immediately brought up the fact that Nova was not in there. Yeah, my nephew was super disappointed that Nova wasn't in there, too. And I was just like, well, who cares? Batman wasn't in there either. Do you know who Nova is? I had no idea. Yeah, I, I know who Nova is. Um, but but those dudes, you know, were all part of the Nova Corps. Right, yeah, that's, that's I was asking, when I asked my, I was like, who is Nova? And my son popped up his Wikipedia page, and he's like, oh, well, he was part of the Nova Corps, so you think it would be natural for him to be on there. And I thought, oh, well, maybe he was one of those <laughs> random guys. Well, what it is is, you know how there's the Green Lantern Corps on, in D.C.? Uh -huh. But the guy, the, Hal Jordan or Kyle Rayner or whoever it is, is Green Lantern. This is the exact same way. There's the Nova Corps, but there's one guy that was known in the comics as Nova. And so Richard Ryder, I think, was his name. Uh huh. I don't know. When I was looking on the Internet and found that page with all the Easter eggs, I also found one that said something about that uh, the director thought Nova was lame. And didn't want to include Good him. Good for him. And he would probably never show up in any of these Guardians of the Galaxy movies because he's apparently lame. See, I, I can't argue with that because he seems lame to me too. But I'm sure there are people out there that said Rocket Raccoon is lame. You can never make a movie about a talking raccoon and have him take it seriously. Or whoever it is. Glenn Close's hairstyle is lame. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was truth with a capital T. I don't know if I would say it was lame, but it was definitely weird. She looked comical. I mean, you know who else was really good? Uh, was John C. Riley. That oh, moment right. at the end of the movie where he picks up his green, uh, sorry, his pink daughter and pink wife, and uh -huh. he's hugging them. I was just like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I liked his bit at the end where they're like saying goodbye to him, and they're like, just don't break any laws, and we won't be uh, have to have any problems with you. And like, well, what if I do this? And he's like, well. That's uh, stealing. And yes, that is against the law. And then Drax is like... He's like, what if I find someone irksome and I pull out his spine? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, that, that, that's called murder. Uh, that's one of the worst things uh, yeah. you can do. And, and, and so it's a crime. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. It cracked me up because I could not hear his voice without thinking of Wreck-It Ralph. Every time he would talk, I'd be like, ah... Oh. <laughs> I was just seeing Ralph being just like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually with the uh, candy tree trimming department. Uh, we're here uh, trimming trees in the area. I liked kind of the, the, the whole group of them and their little interplay. I guess he was part of the Nova Corps as well then. Yeah, I guess so. And oh, and that speech he delivers where he's like, he is an a-hole, but he's not 100% uh, a dick. Yeah. And she says, do you believe him? He says, I, I don't think anybody is 100% a dick. <laughs> yeah, they had a lot of fun stuff in there. I really liked the interplay with our five main characters. That one scene where they're all getting together and he gives them the speech about how they're all a bunch of losers that needs to come together. Just the way that they would interact with each other and argue with each other and kind of go off on tangents or say silly things or etc they they really put together a good bunch of characters for that film yeah 
and it wasn't the it wasn't the plot so much as seeing these characters interact that made me love the film and made me want to see these characters again that that part where Drax is saying you know he's he says each one of their names and you are my friend remember uh -huh. and then he gets to Gamora and he says what did he call her it's like green whore yeah you are he called her this green which I thought was pretty interesting because you know it it just gives you clues you into his character again he's so dumb to the point where and he hasn't he still can't get over his hate for this person and yet he's saying that she's his friend but he calls her that this green whore <laughs> is is my friend and she's just like oh sh that's it you know she obviously is not because he's dumb you know he says something so unbelievably offensive to this person while saying oh yeah and you're my friend and then they get attacked right at that moment. Right. And, and he says, nobody talks that way to my friend. Yeah. And she's about to get hurt. And he basically saves her. And therefore you see, hey, he may be this big, dumb, freaking galoot or whatever. This just guy that doesn't get it. But instead of through his words, through his actions, he proves that he really is her friend. Um, he may say something you know, super offensive and piss her off. But, you know, he also proves that he's her friend by way of, you know, saving her from the uh, trouble that's coming through. So I, I thought that was an interesting bit. Very uh, humorous and perhaps delightfully. Well, no, and that's what I was saying. It's just to see these characters interact and the characters are so well-developed. It just makes me long for a Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which, amazingly, they have announced. And they announced it before Guardians came out, mm -hmm. uh, which to me was, again, it's just like, well, how do you guys know? And the fact that they spent all this money, I think they spent 170 or $180 million on this movie. Somebody somewhere believed in this project enough I, I, to invest that much money in it. How could they have possibly have known that it would be this good and that it would be a hit because I would not have guessed that people would be lining up at for a midnight showing of Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, it's it, it is surprising. It was definitely the riskiest thing that Marvel has done yet. I think it's gone well, right? It, w the midnight showings were brought in like the most of midnight showings over the summer. Yeah, it, it, it out-earned Captain America and Transformers and that as its midnight showing. I mean, it's still the weekend when we're recording this, so we don't know how big a deal it was. But yeah, it opened like a summer blockbuster. Yeah, I heard that uh, it, it made $90 million in on Friday. So Oh, well, if that were the case, then it would be bigger than the Avengers. And, uh, oh, maybe I was... Because Avengers did 202... And it's still the biggest opening weekend ever. So Okay, I, I might be drunk then. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I, I think 90 is the weekend. Oh, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe they projected it out. Friday estimates on Box Office Mojo say 37.8. So, yeah, maybe that would be the whole weekend. So it looks like it's going to do well. We're going to see another Guardians film. So by the time you get... Fudge, what is the name of that episode that we never, ever get done? Empire State Building Strikes Back Done. There will be Guardians of the Galaxy 2 in a theater. <laughs> it seems to me, too, like Guardians of the Galaxy and the Avengers are destined to meet up down the line. We're going to have a super movie coming up in the future where we have so many characters, you're going to have no idea what to do. It's going to be Guardians plus Avengers versus Thanos is my guess. That would be cool, but they could just have Guardians and Thor and and we would all be excited. True. And you may well have something like that in Guardians too. I wouldn't be surprised. But uh yeah, I I'm guessing Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet will be uh down the line. Yeah, I I mean, I, they've already planned out like the next decade of movies, only, you know, they just announce them a little bit at a time. Guardians 2 is the most recent thing that they've announced, but they already announced a director for 
uh, Doctor Strange, even though we don't know who's playing Doctor Strange or when that's coming out. And uh, Captain America 2 has a release date. 3, sorry. So the, the, the fact that they keep making these movies and they keep making money means uh, unlike a, another studio where they would all just retire and go spy yachts and stuff, they're just going to keep making movies. Which is all the better for us. I'm I'm excited to see the lineup down the down the road. Yeah, I am too. Um, one last thing, uh, the coda. <laughs> is that something you're excited about? Is there excitement to be had? Is this something that means something, or is it just a joke? Oh, do you think that that was the uh, Guardians equivalent of the shawarma? See, that's what it seemed like to me. I saw. One of those Easter eggs they said to watch for was that Howard the Duck was in one of the collector's little cases that he has, his little cages or whatever. Apparently Howard the Duck was back there inside one of those. Okay. And yeah, when everything blows up, that's he's let out. And so at the end, you see the collector drinking his little drink. And then Howard the Duck makes his comment... I don't know if that's supposed to be something that is the harbinger of future projects. I kind of hope it isn't, because if it is, then yeah, Marvel... I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, we're going to make the Guardians of the Galaxy into a movie that people are going to want to see. Making Howard the Duck, I find that really hard for anyone to make it work. But maybe that's not true, I don't know. But listen, if you told your kids that the first cinematic Marvel movie was Howard the Duck, they would never believe you. Nobody has seen that movie. <laughs> my, when we, when it came up, I asked him if they knew what that was. My son seemed to think that he knew what Howard the Duck was. My daughter had no idea. But neither of them had any idea that there was a film version of Howard the Duck out there. I didn't realize that it was the first Marvel movie ever. What a way to start off. Yeah, everything else had been television. Yeah, you would think that if you're going to put it in the hands of the guy who just made a gajillion dollars off the Star Wars trilogy, that that would be somebody that could make something great. But it definitely was not great. And I don't see even Marvel Studios being able to make Howard the Duck into something great. But <laughs> Rocket Raccoon was cool. I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe Howard the Duck could be. I I just think it would be a mistake. There's so many things that they could do. It it seems to me like if they did do Howard the Duck as one of their films, that is like a ego trip kind of a thing, where they're saying, "Oh yeah, we can make anything into a success." And somebody said, "Really? Okay, I'm going to give you a challenge. You you pledge." Before I tell you what it is that you're going to make this into a movie and you have to make success out of this, you promise? And the guy says, okay, I promise. What is it that i got to do? Howard the Duck. And then the guy crapped his drawers right there and said, ah, okay. It makes me think of like <laughs> that Bible story where the devil and God are hanging out and talking they're just sitting on a fence, and he says, Hey, have you seen my servant, Job? Yeah. It, that guy rules. It totally makes me think of that. <laughs> Sorry, God was voiced by Will Ferrell in this version. Of yeah. And the devil said, Oh, yeah, what about Howard the Duck? And he went, Oh, duh. That, that, that music played, the little suspense sound effect. But, yeah, I don't know. I, if, if, if that's truly a sign of things to come, then I think it's a mistake. But, you know, you never know. Well, it's got to be way, 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 way down there on the list of priorities. Yeah, But seriously. if he popped up in Doctor Strange or if he pops up in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, you know, and has four or five lines, that's fine, I think. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with the character, even though he's been blighted by that 1986 movie. I thought he was repugnant to look at the way they chose to do him. Yeah, he was really ugly looking. You know, whereas uh, Rocket looked like a raccoon that was just walking on its hind legs. Howard the Duck looked like a duck that had been crossbred with like one of those bald dogs. 
a hairless uh, chihuahua or something. Yeah, anyway. He was gross. Yeah, it did not look good. But yeah, I, I wouldn't... Be, he definitely should not be the lead character of a film ever again. But I wouldn't put it past him is all I could say. I guess we'll see. They're doing Ant-Man after well, all. well, there's one thing that you and I can agree on. We will see a second Howard the Duck movie before Warner's ever makes a Wonder Woman movie. <laughs> That's definitely true. All right. I think we've uh, said our piece. I think so, too. So, um, but that kind of ends out the, the summer movie. Well, our list, at least. Yeah, I'm sure there's a couple more. But yeah, what we tend to go to are certain types of films, and they're basically done. Is there anything Christmas or Thanksgiving time this year that we're going to care about? Well, you're not going to see The Hobbit, but we'll probably get together and talk about Interstellar or Big Hero 6. Ah, Big Hero 6. That's this fall. We might even do a Hunger Games episode. I don't know. Yeah, we didn't do one for the second Hunger Games, and I think it was just in reaction to how much we disliked the way they made the first one. But the second one turned out But we out did to talk be, about it. It was really good. Yeah, it turned out to be really good, and so maybe that will uh, get us into the third one, which is only part one. Yeah. I, I, that kind of cracked me up. They showed the trailer for that at the movie we went to at, at Guardians of the Galaxy, and yeah, everybody groaned when it said Mockingjay part one yeah there was an audible reaction to it and i'm trying to think of if i've ever seen that before i think the first time that they somebody did it was deathly hallows right deathly Hall where they split a book in two. Oh, right okay for some reason i was thinking sleepy hollow and i'm like what okay yes i think that was the first one that they split in two but i can't remember if the trailer said harry potter and the deathly hallows or harry and potter and the deathly hallows part one but, like, at least with the Hobbit movies, they don't have a number in the title. They just say, you know, an unexpected journey, the desolation of smog. And it's just, uh, you know. Yeah, they made up titles for those. There's an expectation that there's more, but it doesn't slap you in the face so vulgarly. Yeah, it's just, it, it's become such an obvious money grab that, uh, you know, they did it with Deathly Hallows. And then they did it with the freaking Twilight movie. And then they did it with the Hobbit and then they did it with this Mocking J one, and they did it now. Also, isn't isn't part three of Divergent supposed to be a two parter? Oh, really? I'm pretty sure I heard that as well. Yeah, I haven't really followed Divergent, which is surprising because they haven't even made that much money off of those, have they? No, Divergent didn't do all that well, but I don't think it was very expensive either. All right, yeah, it's it's uh, a sad thing, but maybe we'll talk about that when. Uh, winter comes around i guess we shall see winter is coming now see that's something that they ought to do that with have we talked about that they should have split feast for crows into two seasons uh, dances with dragons into two seasons although they still wouldn't finish in time yeah that's probably true they did have to do that somewhat though they had to combine those two because those are the two books which were basically happening concurrently and he separated them by characters instead of by time period well then they should have split it into four hours four yeah, four, four seasons, seasons or five seasons or the four seasons they should have done jay-z boys okay so um yeah uh we are done with our guardians of the galaxy talk and uh we're gonna let you folks go your merry way hope you enjoyed the uh show if you have any comments about it we will have a, uh, you know, on our forum, we have a little discussion board where you can talk what you give your take on it, what you thought of the film, what you thought of this line and that line and that character, etc. So head on over there and we can discuss it. We would love to. Yeah, that would be fun. Uh, I'm Big Anklevich. Who? And I'm Star-Lord, man. Oh, Famous outlaw? Finally. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you later. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons 3.0, attribution, no derivatives, share-alike license. That means you can't sell it, but you can share it with everybody. It also means you have too much time on your hands. Guys, 